Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's talk. We are going to be covering what matters most to sustainably conscious food shoppers. We are going to walk through some research and we're gonna leave some time for Q&A at the end. So for those of you who don't know us, uh, Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform. We help many B2B, B2C businesses make faster consumer-centric decisions. So we work with over 400 companies currently. Uh, we have quantitative and qualitative research uh, solutions within our platform. We also own our own panel. So this really helps our customers be able to make fast uh, decisions, asking quick, agile questions, but also tapping into larger research studies like segmentation. So the background of the study that we're going to review today, um, we conducted research at the beginning of April with around 1,000 Americans with a census-weighted sample. So first to introduce myself, I'm Melissa Dunn, the SVP of marketing at Suzy. I've been with the company for about eight months. Um, as I mentioned, we work with over 400 different customers, big brands like TikTok, Pepsi, Unilever, many in the food and beverage space. We work with over 22 verticals um, that we have as customers, but food and beverage is really one of our bread and butter uh, verticals. So we're excited to talk to you guys today. I am going to just give Eric the floor to introduce himself as well. Fabulous. Thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend some time with us. Um, I'm Eric Pierce, Vice President of Business Insights at New Hope and Informa. I'm responsible for the Marketplace Insights teams at New Hope, specifically Nutrition Business Journal and Next Data and Insights. My team and I see it as our role to help drive responsible growth for the natural and organic products industry. And we work to do so by giving the marketplace a voice and to help use that voice through data to help inform decision making across the industry. Ultimately, it is my hope that data and insights can help us cultivate a prosperous, high integrity CPG ecosystem that creates health, joy and justice for all people while regenerating the planet. Looking forward to our conversation today, Melissa, and thanks again for letting me join you. Of course, I'm very much looking forward to diving in here. So if we think about the word sustainable, it's actually one of the biggest buzzwords in the food and beverage sector. So it seems to be everywhere. But one thing we are going to explore is do consumers actually believe the buzz? And have we paused to actually consider how sustainable is defined? I think we're very quick to use the word sustainable in messaging and packaging. Um, but the question is, what does this really mean to consumers? At Suzy, we've actually been focused the entire month on sustainability. Um, in one of, our, one of our other surveys, we actually talk about the brand Patagonia, um, which obviously is not a food brand, but they've stopped using the word sustainable entirely, which is very interesting. They acknowledge that they are a for-profit enterprise and that they are in fact part of the global climate change problem. So how are we defining this word? How should we be defining this word, especially in our brand language? So the word sustainable, I think, you know, conjures up images of recycling or solar panels and saving the planet. One definition is obviously causing or made in a way that causes little or no damage to the environment. But another way to look at this, which I think is really interesting, is that the purest definition of this word, it actually means that something cannot be maintained or continued. So if we think about you know, extreme or fad dieting, it's not actually sustainable over a long period of time. Um, so, you know, I think shopping sustainably is currently very difficult to sustain. Um, I think consumers and, you know, everyone out there is saying, how do I be sustainable and do it, you know, throughout my life or throughout a long period of time? Um, and it's something that they are struggling with on a day to day basis. So in this webinar, we're excited. We're going to explore through the lens of, you know, three different areas. 
how food and beverage sustainability can become more sustainable. So we're going to cover the consumer lens, the product lens, as well as the brand lens. Uh, Melissa, I, I love this idea, and I'm going to add just a little more context if I can. Um, I love the idea of how do we make sustainability more for, more sustainable for consumers. And as many of you on the call probably know, the reality is that this topic is nuanced, it's broad, and it's complex. Uh, and when we talk about sustainability, we're often talking about environmental health, animal welfare, carbon emissions, food waste, energy usage, food access, the list goes on, social justice, fair wages, supporting local communities. And when we engage consumers in conversations about sustainability, they're often being asked to recycle or compost, buy organic or buy free range or buy fair trade, avoid plastic, reduce consumption. Oh, man. And it's all important and it's all part of sustainability. And seriously, that is a massive list. It's easy to get overwhelmed and confused. And I'd argue that it's even confusing and full of uncertainty for experienced industry members. Um, but we can't let that hold us back, right? Our industry has a massive impact uh, on the planet on our communities and on our customers. Historically, much of it has been extractive or degenerative in nature. Um, and I would say we have a massive opportunity for being the impetus for change. Let me size that for you for a second. Every day, consumers make decisions about the food and beverages that they consume, adding up just in the United States to a total US agriculture and food value chain worth more than $13 trillion. That means we as an industry have an opportunity to funnel trillions of dollars annually into more sustainable business practices. How many other industries can say that they can make an impact on sustainability daily worth trillions annually via $3, $5, $7 purchases at delis and grocery stores and convenience stores? Sustainability is an unwieldy and difficult conversation, full of complexity and nuance, but one that we must act on and one that we can get excited about because we can really have an impact every single day. So the challenge that we're going to talk about today is figuring out how do we make sustainability something consumers want to engage in? How do we figure out for ourselves as businesses what commitments we can make? How do we figure out how to simplify complex topics for marketing terms so that we can communicate in a nuanced but meaningful way that doesn't greenwash or mislead when we talk to consumers and then work to ensure that our brands are taking responsibility? That's, that's a little bit more about this sort of topic that we're approaching today. And so I'm excited to do it with you, Melissa. Thanks again. Thanks, Eric, for that. I think, you know, you bring up a really, really good point. I mean, all those all those points are really complex and I couldn't agree, agree more. There's a lot of complexity in this. And so we're first going to take a, a look at consumer sentiments, um, as you mentioned, around sustainability. And like I said, we've been doing a lot of research this month. And we've actually learned that consumers do have a real desire to be more sustainable, but what this means to them, it varies from industry to industry. When we actually think about food and beverage, consumers are doing a few things. They're limiting food waste, and they are also supporting environmental health as their sort of first and foremost tactics. So during this section, we're gonna unpack how they're feeling about sustainable products and what sacrifices they're actually willing to make in the name of sustainability. So consumers say they want food and drink that have a positive impact on the environment. The number one way in which they do this is by recycling. So 60% of consumers recycle and that's a choice that they, that they make um, as a way of taking food and beverage consumption and making it more sustainable. So recycling does seem pretty easy to do in most instances, um, but it doesn't actually affect anything related to, you know, enjoyment of the product itself. So while recycling doesn't seem like a huge sacrifice, uh, consumers are saying that they are actually willing to make certain sacrifices for the sake of sustainability. So we're gonna dive into what some of those things are. So almost half of consumers would choose a different brand if they felt it was more sustainable. 
So this could be an opportunity, especially for brands that are sort of rising in the category to really make a name for themselves and they can lean in and own what sustainability practices they're following and really be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. 30% of consumers would actually sacrifice convenience to make their food shopping more sustainable. But ultimately, consumers don't want to sacrifice the food and beverages that they love. Um, for many products, consumers can pick a different brand because they're essentially still getting the same product at the end of the day. But for many consumers, it's obviously much harder for them to make a swap from, say, I don't know, a beef burger to a veggie burger. Um, it's a bigger trade-off for them. So despite the fact that um, apparently avoiding meat and dairy is the most effective way to stop, to, effective way to food shop sustainably, um, what we're seeing here is that actually only 10% of consumers are limiting both their meat consumption and buying non-dairy milk. So it's interesting because while the plant-based movement has obviously grown considerably in recent years, um, we're still seeing that only 10% of consumers say they are both limiting meat consumption and buying non-dairy milk. Um, in 2020, SPINS reported that 15% of retail milk sales were plant-based. So it's moving in the direction, but I think people are not willing to make the sacrifice of both. It's sometimes an, you know, an or, if you will, instead of an and. And for me, this was a really surprising stat because a quarter of people were saying that they're willing to compromise on flavor. Um, I know when I saw this research, I was wondering if this is a case of say versus do. Um, but al although 26% say they would be willing to sacrifice taste, it's actually the last thing that consumers um, are willing to sacrifice. 41% weren't willing to sacrifice and it was last on the list. So why should consumers in fact, have to sacrifice enjoyment. Um, this is, you know, something that ultimately I think people want pleasure out of food and drink. And is there a way to create sustainable practices within, um, you know, something that people care a lot about? So our first insight here is that, you know, people won't respond well to sustainability if they feel like they have to sacrifice pleasure. Um, you know, this is a really important, you know, point. I think ultimately it's how do we find this balance of, you know, giving people satisfaction and the foods that they love while still making them sustainable. Yeah, I think this Eric, point. Do you have anything uh, to add here? Yeah, for sure. Um, not a big point. I think you you really made this one clear, but. I also just want to reinforce that that people don't accidentally get the wrong impression with this insight, right? Consumers are motivated to engage with brands and to engage with sustainability. When we ask consumers what they're doing to make their food and beverage consumption more sustainable, we did see a very large number of common responses that a good number, if not the majority of people were uh, we're engaging with. Only 19% of consumers say that they aren't doing anything to make their consumption more sustainable. Um, but yeah, imagine what we could do if it didn't feel like a trade-off. Imagine what we could do if sustainability felt like the easy choice, the enjoyable choice. Um, and if consumers are willing to switch brands for more sustainable options and you can figure out how to make it not feel like it's a, a, a sacrifice, um, maybe maybe you're ready to, to market this in a way that gives consumers, you know, the option and the reason to, to make that switch. We'll talk more about that um, soon as well. Yeah, 100%. A lot of great things that you said that we'll cover in the brand section. Um, so what's the so what? I think ultimately, you know, make sustainability enjoyable and make it easier for consumers when we think about, you know, paper straws, um, which, you know, I, I understand they are helping the environment, but let's be honest, they're really hard to drink out of and they ultimately, you know, sort of 
shrivel up and half the time you can't actually drink out of them once you started. So I think there's definitely work to be done in this space. Um, we did want to sort of bring you into one really interesting brand that we think is doing a really great job. Um, it is from a company called Airco and they make vodka. Um, they have two ingredients, it's water and CO2. They actually extract CO2, CO2 from the atmosphere and they use it to create ethanol. Um, and this is pretty surprising since obviously there's a big fermentation process that happens with alcohol, but they're really solving an environmental problem here, um, which we thought was very cool. So, you know, I think it's just companies are being more innovative in their product and, you know, we're gonna move into the product section um, in which Eric is gonna take us through. Fabulous. Thanks, Melissa. All right. As a reminder, we've got three chapters today. We're touching on the role of consumers, which we just did, products, which we're doing now, and brands can play in helping make sustainability more sustainable for consumers uh, over time. So let's talk about product. The good news is sustainable products are worth more. Uh, one in three U.S. consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable food and drink. And given the current sentiment regarding issues related to sustainability, it shouldn't surprise us or it shouldn't be a surprise that more than half of consumers, 54 percent, say that it's important for brands to take action uh, to operate sustainably. In fact, 50 percent of consumers believe that it is your responsibility to do so. Specifically, 50 percent said uh, that they believe it is your responsibility to take action to operate your business more sustainably. Um, but what exactly are consumers looking for when it comes to sustainable food and beverage? Do no evil, right? No Evil Foods is actually a brand uh, responding very directly, I believe, to in their with their branding to what they believe consumers want. Their mission statement is do no evil. Uh, I believe this is spot on for consumers who want to know that their purchases are helping to create a positive change in the world and that the brand that they're buying from simply does no evil, right? Let's, let's empathize for a second with consumers just to kind of bring some of this home for you. Um, what is the most common human reaction to fear, uncertainty, or discomfort, right? The most common human response is to take action, to reduce pain in this experience. In order to reduce pain, one needs to take control and take action and do something, right, to remove yourself from that pain. However, in our modern food system, there are hundreds of decisions that are made between seed and shelf, hundreds of decisions that are made on behalf of the end consumer that they have almost no visibility into and no control over. In if a consumer is feeling anxious or they're feeling fear or uncertainty or even just discomfort regarding the urgency to act on climate change or social justice or other sustainability topics, and they feel like they have no direct control in doing so, your product, your brand, the decisions you make as a business become the conduits for the control that consumers are seeking. In this context, consumer trust in your product, in your brand, in your day-to-day decision-making become critical. In this context, the promise, the brand promise of do no evil feels really powerful to me. So consumers are willing to pay more. They feel it's important that your business uh, act. They feel that it's your responsibility to, to take action. Then what do consumers want from you? I've mentioned this already, Melissa has as well. The reality is sustainability is really quite complex. And that reality is reflected in this list. When we ask consumers what they believe are the three most important things in food sustainability, they told us the following, limiting food waste at the top, supporting environmental health, improving access to quality food, uh, protecting animals, reducing carbon emissions, supporting the local community, uh, providing fair wages and pursuing social equity and justice. Only 10% of consumers said that none of the above were important to them. What we see in this list is that sustainability lives in your business values. It lives in the way in which your business does business. It lives in the integrity of your business and sustainability lives deep in the operations of your business. Yes, 
Sustainability is a product feature or benefit as well. But sustainability doesn't begin with marketing or product necessarily. Sustainability starts with the integrity and intent. Sustainability lives or dies in the details and the execution. If we allow shallow or transactional, uh, or if we allow it to be shallow or transactional or without nuance, if we allow marketing to drive product sustainability efforts, then I would say we uh, risk giving up when the marketing ROI isn't clear, or we risk making empty promises and then being found out for them and doing damage to our brand and our customer relationship. So kind of what I'm trying to say here is sustainability is complex and it really does need to live, uh, in, be inspired by broader purpose and strategy and to live in operations uh, and then to find its voice in marketing. So Marketing must find compelling ways to talk about uh, differentiating sustainability stories in a way that resonates with consumers as well. And doing so in a way that communicates truthfully is important. One example of this, uh, taking really complex issues and finding ways to engage consumers truthfully, I think, is food waste and upcycling. We saw a minute ago that reducing food waste resonates strongly with consumers. It was the number one uh, way on the list that consumers were hoping brands would help improve sustainability. Um, but it's really hard. I don't know if you've thought about it or done it yourself, but it's really hard to market a product made out of trash <laughs> or maybe something that's just perceived as a waste product or a byproduct or something that inherently doesn't have a good perception uh, initial reaction in consumers' mind. And yet there's been a lot of innovation over the past five years in this very specific early area. Early pioneers in this space are Regrained and Upcycled Food Association. Regrained started as a finished goods company turning spent beer grain, a byproduct of the beer brewing process that is traditionally thrown away or fed to pigs, uh, they take that and turn it into energy bars and baked goods. Today, they're working to scale as an ingredient company by building a marketplace for this upcycled ingredient. And the founders of Regrained also helped to launch the Upcycled Food Association, a growing certifier of products repurposing food ingredients that otherwise uh, would not have gone to human consumption. Choosing to center this sustainability conversation on the idea of upcycling is a lot easier for consumers to engage with than talking about byproducts or turning food waste into food itself. So insight number two, consider both how a product is made, but also uh, given the difficult nature of these topics, we also need to be give careful consideration to how we talk about sustainability with consumers, both how it is made and what it is called is important. Melissa, was Eric, there something you wanted to add on this one? Yeah, 100% yeah. agree with that. I think, you know, we'll talk about it in the brand section, but, you know, sustainably, sustainability is inherent, I think, to the brand and to the product. And ultimately, how it comes to life in marketing is really important. And it's not just, you know, about what it's called, um, but, you know, how it's spoken about what the perception is to the consumer and ultimately what the takeaway is. And this is, you know, from both marketing speak, but also really to your point around the operations pieces, starting, you know, from the beginning and being able to talk about it in a way that makes sense and is truthful. Yeah, indeed. And, and that's kind of our so what for this section, right? Um, there's going to be tension between marketing and operations, tension between the desire to simplify something, to speak about it in consumer-friendly marketing terms, and the need to build potentially, probably, unsexy, unglamorous sustainability programs that get real work done. The need to build sustainability programs that do the messy work uh, that is true to your purpose uh, and intention. So what? So what? We must work to engage uh, and manage this tension and to find ways to talk about sustainability in a way that simplifies inherently complex programs and which connects with people, but is careful not to mislead or greenwash in the process. Uh, and with that, um, back to you, Melissa. Thanks, Eric. Um, so as our last chapter, uh, we are going to dive into brands. Um, we've looked at consumers and products. Uh, what are brands doing around sustainability and what do consumers actually want to see from them? So consumers want to be informed. I think that is first and foremost. Uh, they are looking for transparency from brands and they wanna know the impact of their purchases. 
they also want to be educated um, and they want brands to help them understand what this all means. So 54% want brands to give them more information. And this goes back into what we discussed in section one, just being transparent and educating. Brands have a platform to really help drive, you know, people's opinions, perceptions, and change, frankly. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for brands to share more information um, and help take part in this. So we don't want to put the reliance on the consumers and ultimately make them fully responsible. We really believe that brands need to help consumers see how their products are at aiding sustainability efforts and what are brands actually doing. So you can see here that consumers really are looking for information around packaging materials. How are things being created? Um, you know, what are the recycling efforts that these brands are taking part of that in turn, a consumer can actually take part in and how to shop more sustainably. I think, you know, consumers are really looking for guidance. Um, and I think this is a brand's responsibility. Um, so ultimately, we want brands to educate and not implicate. Um, you know, consumers don't want to feel as though brands are holding them responsible or passing the buck. Consumers think that it is food and beverage brands who are responsible for improving sustainability in this sector. Um, we published a white paper earlier this month. As I said, we've done a ton of research on this topic, just given how timely it is and important. Um, but consumers in this research that we did said that businesses really should be taking on a tad bit more, more responsibility than individuals or the government. Um, only 12% actually said no one was responsible, but they ranked corporations and businesses as sort of the number one um, entity, if you will, to take more responsibility. So really we want, you know, to look at this eco guilt you know we hear from brands don't eat meat be a vegan recycle avoid single-use plastics stop shopping fast fashion you know and i think obviously this article showcases like the list goes on as far as telling you know consumers not to do certain things or to do certain things um but ultimately you know what can brands do to make it easier for consumers so bio, biodegradable, um, you know, and compostable packaging is a very, I think, you know, easy example and something that consumers are asking for. Um, this in turn helps make their lives easier. Um, so we put in an example here. Obviously, Frito-Lay is a really big company, but they are testing out a compostable package. Um, natural product companies have been innovating and doing this for a really long time. But I think what's great to see is that a brand like Frito-Lay is actually, you know, testing this out. Um, and if we think back to what consumers said, recycling is actually not as easy as we think it is. They talked about recycling, you know, and we shared data in the first section uh, around how consumers are taking action to recycle. But in many places, recycling actually isn't that easy for consumers to do. So I think, you know, things like compostable packaging where you can make eco-friendly and less wasteful packaging and clearly labeling this, um, you know, gives people the sense of, you know, and gives them the ability to actually take this action um, with something that's easy to do. So if we look at insight number three, um, one thing that we think is pretty important is just easing eco guilt and not adding to it. Consumers are really open about being educated. I think they're frankly yearning for this information. Um, so it's really, you know, the responsibility of different brands to, to take this action and, and do something with it. Yeah, it's a, a fine line between engaging guilt or negative emotions in marketing and actually providing a solution for somebody that relieves pain, right? You know, and, and so look for that fine line because there's a lot of pain and uncertainty that we can remove in consumers' lives without necessarily 
um, uh, creating this feeling of guilt in, in how we market uh, our product. Uh, this insight in particular, I think, is really um, similar to the stated strategies of some vegan and plant-based food companies. And so I'll share it because I think it could be a parallel for maybe how we think about the end goal, not necessarily the expectation today, but the end goal for sustainability efforts. The Good Food Institute um, has advocated for this for a long time. And back when Just Inc. was named Hampton Creek and they were la launching their Just Mayo product, uh, founder and CEO Josh Tetrick described their strategic goal for disrupting animal-based agriculture by compelling non-vegans to buy vegan products. They believe that the only way to do so was not by celebrating the fact that it was vegan. The only way to do so at scale to get more people to buy uh, vegan products that, that were, you know, friendlier on the earth and friendlier to animals um, was to ensure that their products performed at parity or outperformed animal-based products on price, taste, and availability. Tetrick and others believe that only then will we be able to create sizable change in the world. Uh, that's sort of what we're saying here. How do we make the sustainable choice the easy choice? How do we make it something people will enjoy doing? How do we remove the guilt and add the good feelings into the process um, so that people, you know, be, so that this becomes the easier choice for consumers? And again, I'm not saying you have to be at price parity now, um, but maybe find other things that we can do where people, again, are feeling good about feeling good, feeling good about doing good. So, yeah. <laughs> Feeling good about feeling good. I like it too. Feeling good about feeling good. All right. Oops. Oops. I'm sorry. sorry. And I skipped the slide. Sorry. Um, so, so what's the so what here? Um, really, you know, we've talked about it, but taking the weight off of consumers, educating them, coming up with initiatives that are really going to help things. Um, we, again, in our research this month, we found that the 25 largest global CPG companies, and these are brands like Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, have actually committed to either introducing recyclable packaging and minimi or minimizing packaging altogether, or reusing materials. And this is according to a consum the Consumer Brands Association. So 80% of those are working towards a fully recyclable packaging for all of their products by 2030. So that's an incredible commitment. Obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think the fact that these big corporations and organizations have goals um, that they are going to help basically make consumers' lives easier by taking the initiative of these programs, um, to me, this is really key. Um, and I know I you know, buried the lead here, but we did want to show you an example of a really interesting brand called Tony's Chocoloni. It is European, so this is probably why many of you may not have heard of it. This was actually the first time I had heard of it, um, but they're actually on a mission to make chocolate 100% slave-free. So they invest heavily in creating awareness through education and training of both farmers and consumers. They pay a premium to farmers to ensure proper pay. They're actively tracking down and combating child labor. Their beans are 100% traceable to ensure transparency and fairness. Um, so instead of lecturing consumers, they make it really cr clear that this is, the prob this is their problem within the industry. They make it easier for consumers to be sustainable and all they have to do is buy their chocolate. So um, this is a really cool example that we found. Um, and I think the more brands sort of take this on um, as their own, the more consumers are going to, you know, feel also a sense of responsibility, but I think in a lot of ways find a connection with those brands as well. All right, so let us close the way we started. Um, sustainability is complex and nuanced and the details the details really, really matter when it comes to this. Um, sustainability needs to be driven by your integrity and the way in which you do business. It needs to be nuanced and thoughtfully executed. As food and beverage businesses, um, the decisions we make about how we run our businesses and how we source our ingredients and how we pay vendors and employees and how we distribute and sell our products have the opportunity to funnel trillions of dollars of change towards sustainability goals. 
as we transition from an extractive business model to more sustainable ways of doing business and hopefully eventually towards regenerative ways of being in the world, there are exciting opportunities to compete based on our investments and the investments that we're making in being more sustainability. The reality is uh, the topic is nuanced and broad and complex, right? Because of this, it can be hard to engage consumers in your sustainability efforts to compete by communicating that in a way that, that really connects. If you choose to do so, consider the goal of working to make engaging in sustainability truly sustainable for consumers by figuring out how to make sustainability something that consumers want to engage in, make it desirable, make it fun, make it enjoyable, um, figure out what commitments you as a business can make, um, figure out how, uh, for marketing purposes, how to simplify complex topics, yet communicate with nuance that is careful not to greenwash or mislead. Again, kind of that idea of this needs to be operations-led, strategy-led, not necessarily marketing-led. Uh, and then ensure that your business is taking responsibility and ownership for making your business more sustainable and not necessarily just passing it on to consumers as an expectation for them to act. So I think with that, we're going to move into Q&A. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. I'll just make a quick pitch to get some more questions in there. We've got, um, gosh, we've got just shy of a half an hour. Um, so let me find the first one for us to, to start off with. Oh, there's some good long questions here. I'm going to have to come back and read them more carefully. All right, we've got one. What about metal straws rather than paper straws? I don't know that I have an answer to that one. It was just the easiest one to read real quickly. Let me look for another one. Unless you've got commentary on metal straws, Melissa. I mean, I think metal, so I, I would prefer a metal straw over a paper straw personally. Um, I don't know about you, Eric, but yeah. uh, I think that is a that is a great product. Um, that is. Maybe. Maybe like bottle recycling programs. Maybe we need a, a city initiative where people are collecting them. So we've kept three in the glove box of our car that we usually remember to take into the movie theater or something like that. But I love that. Um, yeah. All right. Let me see here. Meatless alternatives um, still have a negative environmental impact. How can we convey the message that they are still better than meat or dairy products? Question. And also, are they better? Um, question. So that's an interesting one. Um, before I answer the how they're better, I'm not, I, I'm not somebody who reads uh, life cycle analyses for these things. So, you know, there's, there's probably some good science behind this that can answer the question better than, than I can on the are they truly better perspective. Um, uh, virtually everything I've seen says that if we, if we compare plant-based agriculture, which has all sorts of flaws and ways that we could critique it and say that it could be done better. And we compare it to conventional animal agriculture, which has a lot of flaws. And I think most, most people understand that there's an improvements that we can be made there that, that plant-based really does win out. Even what I might call sort of uh, dirty plant-based, right? Uh, I think one of the real challenges that the plant-based industry is having is you know, what are the ingredients that we're growing um, and using as an alternative to animal-based products? You know, almonds use a lot of water. Uh, soy, if not done in a non-GMO environment or if it's not grown organically, there's a lot of a, a chemical intensive agriculture that goes into growing soy products, similar for wheat and, and corn um, and other things that find their way into plant-based products. There's stress and there's ways we could be doing that better. Um, and even those dirty ag agricultural practices um, are still, generally speaking, less intensive than growing that same soy product and then feeding it to an animal and expecting the animal to create the, the product that we're going to eat. And so the, the science to me is pretty clear. And there's ways to improve both. Regenerative agriculture is a very exciting practice that can make animal agriculture much more sustainable. The challenge is scaling that. Um, and can we feed uh, the world with the meat consumption desires that our culture has and other cultures have using regenerative agriculture? Maybe. I would hope that we can. Um, and I think that plant-based has a real promise to to help alleviate some of that pressure, uh, make cropland available for, for, animal, for regenerative animal agriculture or for land reform issues and other things. 
Um, but there's improvements that can be made to how the average plant-based product is done as well. Let's do more of it organic. Let's do more of it non-GMO. Let's make sure we're not growing those in, in chemicals uh, intensive farm systems if we can. So that's a way long answer on are they better. It's a nuanced, as with anything sustainability, it's a nuanced answer. How can we convey the message better? I don't know. Do you have any ideas from a brand perspective, Melissa, on how to communicate that, that plant-based might be better in these cases? I mean, I think, again, it is it is really interesting thinking about, you know, plant-based and that comms. I think, you know, if you start to read the ingredients, uh, I think, you know, people will see that a lot of, you know, these products are, you know, they, they have preservatives, they have things in them that, you know, are maybe not meat or, you know, animal, but they, you know, some of the things that people still don't even understand what they are. So I don't know. I think for me, plant-based is, you know, there's the marketing side of it, but then there's also the actual product development side of it and really finding ways to make a product that is plant-based that actually feels like you're eating real food um, and, you know, that you're not just sacrificing sort of the taste of what a meat product is, but you're actually eating something healthy as well. Um, so I think for me, it's about, you know, both the product, but then also the way we talk about it. Um, and this sort of leads into another question that we had in the chat around, um, you know, shying, brand shying away from the, using the word sustainable and what words should we be using other than sustainable? I mean, I think trying to find vocabulary, um, we talked about this a few months ago, Eric, but if I think about natural, organic, sustainable, there, there is just so much nuance and complexity, which we've said during this hour. Um, but I think it's about finding, you know, real words to communicate what something is. And there's a lot uh, that I think there's perception around natural. There's someone I follow on Instagram and I was telling um, someone on my team this morning, she really is taking a look and calling out brands that are calling something natural. But if you actually look at the ingredients on the back, it says it's, you know, natural flavors it's not really natural, it's actually artificial. And so I think we need to almost redefine and relook at the vocabulary um, and say, how do we message this in a way that actually feels real? Um, what are better words to describe something? And, and how do we sort of strip away some of, I would call it fluff in a way. It's like consumers are confused enough when they go to the grocery store and they have so many choices and then they start seeing all these labels. Um, ultimately, I think we've got to find a vocabulary that really resonates with consumers and is truthful at the same time. How do we bridge that? Um, but to me, as I've been thinking about sustainable and really what that word actually means, um, you may, said it earlier, but it's not just the marketing, right? It is starting from the beginning as far as supply chain and all of the things from an operational standpoint that really go into this. To me, marketing is sort of the last, um, you know, sort of one of the last points on, you know, the process, you know, journey, if you will. It's really how do we message? How do we communicate? And um, we need to, I think, do a better job of finding the words that actually can communicate the right things um, out to consumers. Yeah, I love that. I'll say the same thing, I think, in a slightly different way. Be specific. Sustainable is so broad and almost meaningless. It's a concept. It's not an action. Describe what you're doing, right? Like, get specific with consumers. That's the best way to probably avoid a lawsuit as well. Claiming you're sustainable is like, that's a big, broad assumption. Claiming that you're reducing, you know, your water impact by doing something specific, call that out, right? Like tell people the things you're doing. Um, I, uh, question from April here, are consumers willing to take steps from conventional to organic on a path towards more sustainable choices? And do you have any data on this? Um, we didn't ask that question directly or anything uh, super direct to that. Um, some of the survey data that I've got shows that 
interest and engagement with organic. Uh, we're just beginning to, to analyze some work that we're going to be putting out later this year in our Ways of Eating report. But um, and I'm going to get the numbers slightly wrong, so give me a, a couple of percentage points fudge room on this. But I think in 2013, when we did a survey, we saw that about 13 percent of about nine or 10 percent of consumers thought organic was important or were engaged in that similar number for interest in natural products. And those numbers are now sort of more in the 20s or 20, you know, 22, 23 percent of consumers saying that. Similarly, I think if you wanted data, you could uh, look to the Organic Trade Association. We work with them on their market sizing report every year. Um, and what you could look at is the, the shift in the growth in organic um, in the US in terms of retail sales over the years uh, to at least show that, that can, some consumers are making that shift. Organic is not a perfect case study here. It's a, it's a challenging conversation and one that, that has not always been as clear in the mind of consumers, but that's the best data that I can think of uh, April on that, that one specifically. Yeah, and I just want to comment, Katrina put something in here. Um, I'm definitely not suggesting that, um, you know, bioengineering plant-based foods isn't sustainable. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways it is. I think, um, you know, in my mind, I was speaking more around, um, you know, just how the actual ingredients, um, you know, when you compare them to sort of real actual you know food itself and those simple ingredients um to me that's sort of what i was trying to get at there so i think you're completely right there's been a ton of improvements in you say yield and nutritional profiles um through this technology i eat a lot of plant-based food so I'm definitely not knocking it, but I think sometimes, especially when we look at, you know, the stat we talked about around, you know, meat and non-dairy, um, you know, consumers are basically, you know, being sort of pushed to eat more plant-based. Sometimes they don't necessarily know what they're getting. Obviously, the packaging helps give them that answer. Um, but I think when we think about, you know, pushing people to plant-based foods, obviously there's a huge benefit from a sustainability perspective. But like we talked about, there's sometimes the sacrifice of, of the flavor profile or certain things within that um, that I think we just have to take into account. So very good point. And obviously not something I was trying to imply in my statement. Um, I did want to make one other note that Renee had mentioned a company that we actually highlighted in a blog we wrote about. So there's a company called TerraCycle, and there's actually a number of other um, companies out there that are really working hand in hand with food and beverage companies and CG companies to make recycling and making reusable packaging and, and making those things a lot easier for consumers. There's a ton of programs that we highlighted in a blog from earlier this month. So I think there's there are also these third party entities that are taking responsibility amongst themselves to really partner with brands and again sort of bridge the gap between brand consumer and how do you make it easier um, and you know how do you help them on both sides yeah um, uh, we've got another comment from Renee here about um, uh, how do we get more money into the supply chains uh, to use products that are more sustainable like seaweed foam um, and some other examples that are using uh, warehouses using solar power or only using biodegradable or, or compostable packaging is the, the essence of the question. And, and I think that's a really good one. And I don't think there's an easy answer. Some of it is, yeah, some consumers are willing to pay more for that. But I also think we need to think about the entire value chain and say, how do you engage all of the stakeholders in a conversation about what are we willing to give or what are we willing to invest to make this more sustainable choice? It's not easy. It's not difficult. It almost always comes as a little bit of a sacrifice. So maybe you need to bring, if you've got 
investors or company owners, maybe you need to get them in, in uh, sold in on the idea of why giving up a little bit of margin or profit might be a value for doing this. You need to bring in retailers in and make sure they're understanding why they're doing that so that when they are looking at your price point relative to others, they understand what's going on. Maybe they're willing to sacrifice a, a fraction of a margin point or something. But have that conversation broadly about who you are and what you're doing and why you're making these investments because it's not just the consumer's responsibility to take on that higher cost. But if everyone across the supply chain shares a little bit in this, we're making better decisions together, I think we can begin to allow for there to be more money in an otherwise price and margin centric sort of environment, allow more of that money to be available for making the right choices in the investments. Uh, we can't pass it all on to the consumer and we can't take it all on as one company ourselves. I, I think we need to engage the community of stakeholders that are involved in that decision making in, in the importance of doing it and, and hopefully share the cost. I don't know if that's the answer, but that's one of the answers. It's definitely important for young startup brands in the natural product space to make sure that they have the right investor money. Somebody who's not going to look at their margins and say, you know what, go back to plastic. Uh, the margin's more important, right? Like you'd ha if, if you're about sustainability, if that's your brand, if that's your purpose and your mission, oh my gosh, make sure you're bringing on the right investors so that when they flex their ownership muscle, um, they're doing it in a way that supports your values as opposed to compromises them. Sorry, there's a little soapbox I sometimes get on with that one, but the right money <laughs> is really important. Uh, engage it. Yeah, um, Eric, um, Ray actually had a, a comment in or a question in the chat, which is similar to price, but more around are consumers willing to pay more and whether we you know, saw that in the research. I think throughout the research we've been doing you know, for the past few months, I think you know, it is harder for people to pay more when, um, you know, prices, I think it's really right now, even inflation that's impacting a lot of the prices out there. Um, I think people are willing to pay more um, for sustainable products. Um, but your point you make around sort of there's a price difference between processed foods and more sustainably sourced foods. I think, you know, people are striving to be um, sustainable as best they can. But I do think sometimes based on what we saw in the research, price can definitely be a factor and a reason why they don't choose um you know more sustainable products at the end of the day they can be more costly and um for people especially on a budget especially given inflation and what's happening right now i think those often um are some of the first to go um when we're looking at what people are you know saving or not spending money on um, things like eating out, you know, travel and things like that. But I think ultimately it's also everyday activities like groceries um, and having to weigh sort of what uh, they're able to afford. Um, what we saw in the research is that, you know, a lot of people want to eat sustainably or they want to take sustainable actions, but sometimes they are either not available to them or the price to do so, um, you know, can be prohibitive. Eric, I don't yeah. know if you have anything to add to that, but. Um, maybe a tangent to it. Just a reminder that sustainability is, is not just about, as we mentioned, it's not just about the environment. Having a sustainable food system means are we making food accessible to those who need it? Are we allowing, are we creating healthy food um, and making it available through our distribution channels and, and other ways? Are we addressing social equity and, and racial biases that, that are, are present in who gets funding within our food system? Who has access to healthy food? Where it is distributed? Um, what products uh, uh, behind the beauty counter are, are behind lock and key versus which ones can, I mean, just the, the number of places where sustainability can impact things beyond just the uh, environmental conversation that we've been having a fair bit. Remember, this is about fair wages. This is about food access. This is about social justice reform. This is about land reform. All of these things impact, are we running a sustainable food and beverage industry? 
no, we're not currently. It's, it, I don't think it was built this way with bad intention in mind, but we've found ourselves in a degenerative system that is extractive in nature, that is pulling value out of communities, out of people, out of our planet. Um, and we need to we need to make that shift. And sustainability needs to be all of these things. There's a lot of correction that needs to be made um, as we pursue a truly more sustainable uh, food and beverage ecosystem. Great, Eric. That was awesome. Um, I think you got a you got a shout out also in the chat, um, <laughs> but a lot of head nods there. Um, do you want to tackle this one? I am not the best person to answer this, but is there a way for meat or dairy to be more sustainable, i.e. grass fed and organic? Yeah, if you're committed to meat and dairy and you want it to be more sustainable, please research uh, regenerative agriculture and regenerative systems. Start with um, uh, the Savory Institute and the land market system. Um, they are, there are some incredibly passionate, very smart people who are doing, you know, amazing work in getting, uh, in reintegrating animals into agricultural systems. And, and that's, that's an important area of innovation uh, within this space and an, an important asset. There's the opportunity to actually um, use animals regeneratively on a farm that helps capture soil carbon, you know, carbon out of the air and get it back into the soil. Um, I, I don't think it's the solution. I don't think any of the solutions we're talking about are the silver bullet we're looking for. I think we need all of the solutions. We need to try a lot of things. And regenerative agriculture is an important one. And so is, you know, plant-based solutions. So, um, but, but yes, absolutely. There's a lot of ways to do animals better than we have. Please look at, at regenerative um, and feel free to reach out to me. I'll connect you with people if, if need be. So. Is there more we wanted to touch on? I was debating more, saying more on bio, the bioengineering conversation, but we've also moved on and we're running out of time. You can go, you can go back there. I think it's an interesting topic and I don't remember exactly the conclusion you guys got to, so I'm not necessarily reacting one way or another, but I will just say there is opportunity and risk, I believe, in the conversation of bioengineering. Um, and just to be really clear, when I say bioengineering, I'm talking about uh, genetic modification in our food system, either it directly in the crops that we're growing or sort of behind the scenes in the technology or the process that is creating an ingredient. Uh, from a sustainability practice, there's a lot of promise um, that there is a lot that can be done to improve sustainability with these technologies. And I'll just caution uh, that um, I think there are a lot of companies that are entering into that space with the right intent and purpose in mind. And I think any tool, any tool, right, um, is no tool is inherently good or evil. <laughs> and that's what I want to say a little bit about bio bioengineering and, and genetic modification. No tool is inherently good or evil, but its application and its intent are what defines if if somebody's going to look at this as a positive or negative in the world and um, i think there's a lot of concern in the consumer population about bioengineering about genetic modification um, and i'm afraid there are some organizations out there that might be pursuing uh, this technology without um without enough transparency. There are companies that are doing it really well in our industry, and I, I have a sense that there are some that maybe aren't being as transparent, maybe uh, maybe more in the ingredient space necessarily than directly in the finished goods space, but I think there's opportunity for confusion, uh, risk, and for a technology that maybe when applied right could do a lot of good in the world to become the next lightning rod conversation in consumers' minds where it becomes a big negative thing because companies uh, used it without proper transparency, purpose, or intent. They used it with profit as the primary motivation as opposed to serious sustainability solutions as the primary motivation. So I would just say, if you're looking at this topic, please make sure you're thinking long and hard about um, the risks and the benefits, the, the transparency necessary in using it and, um, 
and and just how we introduce this to consumers if we introduce it to consumers in a way uh, again i'm advocating for transparency but do it in a way where um we help them see it and understand it transparently so tricky stuff for sure Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, great questions, really appreciate the interactiveness of um, all the input that you gave us. Uh, this will be available um, to view uh, from a recording perspective and we will share that out. Um, Eric, thank you so much again for having me and having Susie and, you know, letting us be a part of the narrative here that you guys are bringing your community through as a thought leader. Um, we feel really honored to be a part of this. Oh, I, I love doing it with you guys. It's a lot of fun. You guys make it easy as well. So thank you. And thanks everyone.